Remember to subscribe and leave a comment to be part of the conversation. Alright Battletech fans, so we are here today for another episode of Battle Talk, and this time we've got ourselves a roundtable meeting of the minds with the creators and the icons behind Battletech International on Facebook. We're going to do a lot of talking today, we've got a lot of cool stuff we want to get out there, but first I'm going to introduce some of my partners here. I've got the Taskmaster himself, Patrick. Alright, I've got Mr. Randall Snyder up in the corner there. How's it going guys? And I have got the main man with the master plan behind Fortress Miniatures and Games, Robert Ash, down there in the bottom left. Say hello. Hey, guys. All right. So the reason why we're doing this today and the reason why we decided to, to get this little roundtable going is Patrick actually had the idea, and, it, and his idea was the impetus behind this whole thing. And he wanted to do some talking about things like the creation of Battletech International and the community of Battletech International. He wanted to talk about kind of how we are helping grow that community and how we're adapting to the change that's going on in Battletech. And we'll get to that in just a little bit, but uh, you guys are gonna ha have way more knowledge about this than I am. I've only been part of this for the last several years. I was not there during the inception. So I suppose uh, if, if whichever one of you wants to take it away, how did Battletech International get started? Um, it was first incep inception of Battletech International was um, a collaboration between myself and four other people originally. And um, it was with Thomas uh, Legeman, who was from Germany, and um, Mike Wheelam and Alex Clark from Canada. And then myself, myself and two others that are, two others, I forgot their names, that came in originally I was out creating a trade and sell group, but Thomas and I like talked it out and said, let's just merge because, you know, I mean, we got good, a good chemistry going with each other and it just all went to a melding and he came up with a, he came up with the idea of just calling it Battle International and I uh, pretty much adopted it to my tra the trade and sell group as well. And then eventually it, uh, bra you know, Battle International like branched out to many other branches. Oh. Sure. Now we have the Battletech International uh, Trade and Sell Group. We have the Battletech International Painting and Customs Group, which I know several people are a part of. And of course, we, you know, my my area, we have the shit posting group. <laughs> I know Patrick. You guys, Patrick <laughs> hates the memes. He's like, ah, talk all you, yeah. uh, kid. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go with this one because after all, I'm gonna go to our meet. Originally, I disliked. It. Because, you know, you were just memeing the crap out of things. And then, you know, I was like, oh, come on, this is getting too old. But then eventually we warmed up to each other and take a look. We're best buds all of a sudden. <laughs> right. I, I, I definitely think meeting in person helped a lot. Uh, as, as some of the viewers at home may remember, Patrick was there when we traveled out to Fontana, California to do a big Tukey game last year. I want to say it was season one, episode seven. We did that. Yep, I was very honored to uh, meet you live in person <laughs> and, you know, I actually game with you. Right now, the Battletech community, I feel, is at, once again, near its peak. And um, Battletech International has helped um, that community in several ways than one. We're in it to spread the, uh, spread the word and love of the game. And furthermore, um, let people know that the game didn't die. It just simply, it just, it just simply needs to be represented correctly. And this is everybody in the world. After all, we have members, um, hence our name. We have members from all over the globe. You know, so that is the one thing. That's why there's no discrimination at all. We have no discriminations against anybody. You are all welcome to join 
Battletech International for, you know, your mecha stomping needs. <laughs> right. It's so, actually amazing how, how big uh, Battletech has gotten again. So, uh, you know, since, uh, you know, harebrain schemes kicked in and, and, you know, revived a lot of people's love for the game, it was like, hey, by the way, guys, this is still out here. And, and we just started seeing a flood of new members in all the Battletech groups. Uh, some of those members are coming over from Warhammer 40k, as I understand it. I haven't, I've seen a few people, but I haven't really seen this massive just exodus like Kerensky style that, that everybody's talking about. I've just, you yeah, somebody here, somebody there, but that's about it. How do y'all feel about that? I mean, all, all new players, we welcome all forms of new players that come into the game. Um, and it's it's nothing bad. I mean, most of these people have you know invested a lot of money on that particular hobby, and you know you can't just like throw it away. You know what I mean? You know, after all, um, we all know that uh, that's an expensive game to begin with, and if you just throw it away in one shot, oh my god, like that's like money down the drain. Right. I, I, I will say, guys, because so I'm only on the I only kind of help on the buy, sell, and trade page where I moderate. But I will say, as far as letting people in, because that's kind of where my niche is with that and then helping with the pricing, but the I'm probably letting in anywhere from and accepting and rejecting. You got to answer the three questions. Answer the three questions. <laughs> um, I'll say that part now. But I'm letting in probably a minimum daily at least 10 people, if not some days 20. I mean, uh, from one or two three here and there to all of a sudden it's 15 20 a day are popping up i mean it's a ton of people that are coming in just to the buy sell and trade so i don't know if they're lurking on other sites or where they're coming from but that i've seen a huge influx there yeah and i've also seen just talking about the how to buy in so we talked a little bit about how much people have invested in in say warhammer and a lot of questions have been, well, how much do I need to spend to get into Battletech? And it's like, well, if you can find the beginner box, 20 bucks. It's like, that is an incredible price point to just start. And then you can just grow from there. And two max is all you need to get started just to see if you like it. <laughs> well, and the cardboard minis, I mean, you know, the yes. standees, that's, you know, I think that sets it apart from many other games, especially when you're talking GW and all that kind of stuff. You know, they're not, they're not going to let you run with standees, whereas for us, go for it. If that's what going to be what, you know, you find your niche with and you like it or you want to try a mech or whatever it may be and you're on the fence, it's a, it's a quick and easy way in and figure out if you enjoy it or not. And I think a lot of people are staying because they do enjoy it. Oh, yeah. We had uh, one of our new players learning Alpha Strike for the first time. Uh, he had little chunks of Legos that he, he brought out. And he's like, hey, this this is such and such tank. And it's like, cool. I know what it is. Now I know what it needs to die, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Need new targets. Exactly. See, Randall made a really good point a second ago when he said that this is probably the biggest that Battletech has been in quite some time. And I've said that ad nauseum here on the show that I remember those times when you could find Battletech at any gaming store within driving distance. They all had it. They all knew what it was. And then it kind of went into a valley and now we're coming up back to that peak again where, you know, it's the wave hasn't crested yet, but it's getting there. And so I suppose this is for everybody if, if they want to answer this question is Patrick, you wanted to talk about, you know, how Battletech International is adapting to the changing culture here in Battletech. How do you think this new pop culture resurgence of the game is changing the culture or how is that affecting everything? With the resurgence of the game, a lot of things seems to be like getting sold out just like that. I mean, Robert here can tell you uh, that he's, that, you know, like starters are just, what you would get them and they're just simply gone. Yeah. Quick, uh, same gone. thing with the Lance Packs <laughs> yeah. as well. The Lance Packs sell out in an hour. Yeah. I would almost think that right now with the resurgence and just the number of people, you know, we keep hearing people are like, oh, does Battletech still exist? But I, I almost feel like there's more people involved in Battletech than there was back in the late 80s. I think, um, you know, I mean, they're, if you look at it, they're selling out of 10,000 units every few months. I mean, that's, and granted, there's a lot of us and a lot of guys out there that, 
have multiples of the same box set or multiples of the force packs or multiples of you know clan invasion or whatever but still i mean they're, they're on what their third run of some of the things they're on their sixth run of a game of armor combat you know there's not that many people it's not like everybody's running around with six copies of game of armor <laughs> combat yeah. um but yet you know if, if you're up to sixty thousand units sold uh you know that's that scale and that involvement I, I i feel like back in the day you know i i know like in my gaming group way back in the day there was one of us that had the box set and we all shared it um you know we all we were all in the same neighborhood we all you know we knew the rules enough that we designed the mechs and we played around with it and all that kind of stuff but it wasn't like everybody had their own box set everybody had all their own miniatures um i mean even for myself as sad as it is to say where i'm at now with it i didn't even know metal miniatures existed eight years ago um it wasn't wasn't my niche i didn't i just i was more into the lore and the other parts of it and i just didn't pay attention to it um and i think we're getting a lot of people in that regard that are just coming into the game and trying it out and um you know and there's a lot of people that want to get into the game and they can't because the product's not there right now uh i don't know that's a big problem yeah i i I wholeheartedly agree i mean i i I feel like we're we're at a point now where i i think i think that in the past there was some concern you know the old land alpha strike lance packs they got stuck sitting on a lot of those for a very long time and i think that that made some folks very skittish about we don't want to overstock and we don't want to have stock sitting in a warehouse unused but i think that we can look and we can see how things are selling for the past two, three, four years, how the Kickstarter did. It is not going to be something that you're going to get stuck with stock, but we there needs to be a three month supply at all times. Um, with the state of where things are going, I think, you know, we, we talk about the GW players. I think there's a lot of GW players and there's a lot of players from other genres that would love to get into it and we don't have it available from right now and if they're jumping on ebay and having to pay 100 120 dollars for game of armor combat instead of the 50 bucks it's going to leave a bad taste in their mouth and we're going to lose players to the negative side of it um if if things don't pick up and get running a little smoother you players asking like oh my god i want to buy a starter badly or you know the game of armor combat badly and it's a struggle so I'm even just the printed books is, is hard to find like I'm a big Alpha Strike uh, advocate, and you can't find the 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 companion or the uh, Commander's uh, Edition. Commander's Edition anywhere. So, you know uh, what I'd like to see him do is release is make it so that that folks a third party whoever had a 3D printer could license and then purchase STL files, and they said, look. You buy the license, it's going to be this much money. And yeah, sure, that sounds like a lot of money right now. But if you sell these miniatures, you can sell them at you know whatever price you think is fair. And we'll provide you with a free PDF that has all the basic rules in it or the rule book that comes with Game of Armored Combat. We'll give you a free PDF that you can print out a map sheet on uh, if, you, if you wanted to. And then you can send it along to people when they buy this stuff from you and say, all you need basically to provide yourself is a set of dice and the rest of this, you can order the miniatures from me. I'll print them for you. And yeah, they're not going to be, you know, gangbusters quality like what we're getting in the boxes, but th- it'll be something and it'll be official and everybody will make money on it. And then you can take and say, okay, just go to your local print shop and print off this map and we'll give you a certificate here that says, you know, you're you're good on copyright. And you could just, if you were willing to do the legwork and do it yourself, then you might be able to start playing without actually having to wait for a, a specific box set. Yeah, that would be a, an excellent idea. I've got a 3D printer and you know, it, finding, I, I love the 3D model community. So we've got so many original artists who are creating their own variations of things that currently aren't available anywhere. So they don't have them at Iron Winds Metals, they're not available through Catalyst Labs. So these guys are creating things that have never been seen in the Battletech universe uh, other than in on paper. And we can 3D print those. But your point to getting licensing, that, that would be an awesome idea. I'm a huge stickler on scale though, because one of the things I'm seeing on uh, like these pirated uh, Etsy pages and stuff, um, <laughs> here's a Jenner 
here's a Marauder. <laughs> I'm like, really? You, you guys printed and sold that? This is a 30 tonner, that's a 75 tonner. Who would do your scaling? Come on, people. So I would love to see official STLs and official scales and like a printing guide from them. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah, like I say, that was just something that had occurred to me over the last couple of weeks as I see all these people selling these different miniatures. And I thought, gosh, there's got to be some way to get your, you know, your thumb in that pie and just say, oh, here's the license. Here's what you got to do in order to keep it. But after that, go nuts. And then you could have independent third party vendors selling miniatures and giving away the, the stuff that comes in the box anyway to these new players and then when you have a restock of the sets you could say okay well we have the the actual product in store now if you want to also pick that up i think having the basic rules you know the beginner's box set the rules and even maybe a game of armored combat if they made that something that was a pdf that people could print even even if you avoid the miniatures end of it because you don't want to give up the rights to that but if you made the rule books available for people to print or to download um i think that that may solve some of those issues i mean there's 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 a crowd of people out there that just love having it in digital um i'll be honest i'm not that's not my niche i like to hold a book in my hand that's that's my thing but um there are plenty of people that just love having that digital i think that they're missing that available i think miniature wise even with the new miniatures once we hit wave two I mean, we're going to run out of it, but I think there's going to be plenty of extras. I mean, you think about what is there, about 9,000 or something, 6,500 to 9,000 of every single miniature that's going to be available just from the first runs. Um, that's a lot of minis that are out there floating around that you could trade and get here and there or direct people to the buy, sell and trade site. And, and obviously, they, I'm hoping that they're already reprinting those miniatures um in the force packs and that kind of stuff i don't i don't know where they're at with that but <clears throat> they need to be looking ahead at christmas coming up oh yeah, yeah. that's big i yeah, gotta I point mean, out though let me let me interject the quick start guides are available from the website for free yep. and they give you all the basic information you need to get started and they also have like print out paper standees so if you want to get started and you just don't have access to it free from the Catalyst website. One thing I want to talk about, and I'd love to get your guys' opinions on this, is this new uh, Wolf's Dragoons uh, support star that they came out. I'm sure uh, Patrick will have something to say about that. But what I think is really cool about this is not just, hey, we're getting new miniatures, neat. It's that it's a Barnes & Noble exclusive. So this is a you know regular retail outlet, a brick and mortar store saying, hey, okay, we will fund the making of this stuff and we will get it back into our stores to me. I've seen Battletech product in Barnes & Noble already, but beginner boxes and armored combat sets. But this, this is a whole nother level to me. Personally, I feel like this is huge for the game. This is like an actual like established retail store saying, we'll roll the dice on you. And I think that's pretty big. But what do you guys think about it? I think, in my opinion, I think it's a good move because, I mean, um, it's after all, a bookstore does have a lot of like um, representation of our game after all they did sell the novels for battletech there yeah. so why not our books and box sets and yeah you're quite correct i've seen actually a lot of the um beginner box set i didn't see armor combat i see i got a, a bunch of uh Barnes and Nobles in my area actually for a while had the uh, uh beginner box set uh, 20 dollar one and i would actually tell people go to Barnes and Noble, they have it over there and then sometimes i would actually to my surprise i would actually see the, um, the battletech um, manual there I was like, okay, that's that because that's interesting that they actually have this here. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to see novels, video game, board game right next to each other. And, and having that shelf space is really important. Yeah, I think I was going to say, I think that'll let them create their own little, you know, you, when you think about it and you're walking through the store and you see a section dedicated to X-Wing or Harry Potter or whatever it is, if we can get a section dedicated to Battletech, it is only going to drum up more and more interest, um, you know, in the game and the hobby that we all love, and, and get more people reading the novels and get more people um, looking at the game. Uh, so I think it's a good thing. Um, 
I, you know, I think it, it's also a good thing, even though it's tagged as exclusive, my understanding is down the road um, after Barnes & Noble sells it for a while, then it's going to lose that exclusive tag. Uh, I don't I don't know if it's three months, six months. I don't know that time period. But then it'll roll over the catalyst having it on their site and then to retail in other areas too. So the fact that Barnes & Noble funded it, to get you know the the, the variants and, and to get that set out there is really cool and you know and maybe it'll lead to to more situations like that so instead of having a kickstarter you got basically barnes and noble doing it for us um on a smaller scale well what i was going to ask you because you know now you have you know your own game store with fortress and whatnot is is that something that you can see based on, let's say this is very successful at Barnes and Noble. And I know we crashed the website like the day it came out. So they must at least have turned somebody's head and said, hey, these people are buying this. But I don't know if they also base it on what people actually buy in store, not just online. But if this is successful enough, let's just talk about that. That's the question. Do you think that other stores besides Barnes and Noble will take notice and be like, you know, hey, uh, what about Target, for example, right. or something like that? That's just an example shooting for the stars there. But, hey, maybe we can get in on this gimmick, too. I, mean, I, I definitely think you're going to see <clears throat> other people branching out. I mean, I remember when Target was carrying X-Wing um, in, in their stores and, and such like that. And so... I don't know that they're going to get into the exclusive type of idea um, products and in the book end of it, but you know if if there's a box set here and there sitting in their game section, you know all the more exposure will take it. Um, uh, you know I, I think I think BattleTech is still niche enough that you know we're not going to go crazy. It's not you're going to see it popping up left and right in every little small market, but I think on you know maybe on like Walmart.com and some of those other places it might start popping up. Um, and having people be able to pick it up. I know Barnes & Noble, I, I think part of the thing is when we as retailers were in, in your local game stores were running out of the beginner's box set in the game of Armored Combat, that only left Barnes & Noble's with the few that they had sitting in stock or on their website. And all of a sudden you get a mad rush and they're selling out of it. I think that that just drummed up the idea for them like, hey, this stuff's selling. Let's get in on and see what we can do making some miniatures. So, I do think retailers are starting to pay attention to gamers in general. So, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't have really any like role playing games or tabletop gaming at major real t retailers. Then all of a sudden, you know, Wizards of the Coast gets bought out by Hasbro. And now you've got Dungeons and Dragons in the stores. You've got Magic the Gathering in these major retailers. Uh, we've got Battletech on shelves at Barnes & Noble and other major retailers. You know, the, the industry is paying attention and they're saying, hey, these nerds have money. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we want it. And hey, they want to spend it on this stuff. So why not? And I, I think that's kind of a, a trend that I see coming. Um, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about Funko Pops, you know, because Funko Pops, they have a Target exclusive, a Walmart exclusive, and you can only get these things there. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, gosh, if the in-store sales are as good as what the hardcore fans like us are buying when we're crashing their website, then, you know, you might see other retailers catching on to that and going, well, hey, if they're making a bunch of money on this stuff over here and they're marketing to this niche group, like, why can't we do the same thing? Sure, we'll pump a few hundred K into this to, to you know, pull some miniatures out of it. And then people will come to our store, not just to buy the minis, but you know how it is, like when you're at Target or Walmart, that's not all you're there for. You know, you're going to buy other stuff while you're in there. That was just the thing that got you in the door. And I really think that if the sales are good in store, then we have a pretty good shot at at getting something, at least one other store to check this stuff out. Right. So I'd like to springboard off of this. Uh, I don't want to steal your questioning thunder, but uh, <laughs> no, please. No, 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 no. This is a round table, my friend. Get on in there. Yeah. I'm curious what all you guys are doing to kind of drum up support and interest in and Battletech and Alpha Strike and the other uh, game systems they've got. Funny enough, like the store I frequent has actually a lot of people that do play like, other games, but they'll always get curious about Battletech when we're playing it because we have such enthusiasm with my players. They're like, oh my God, what game is this? And he goes, they'll go, is it like Gundam? It's like, is it like uh, Robotech? I'm like, actually it's called Battletech. And yeah, it's about Microsoft. You actually play like, you know, I even told them like, 
hey, there's even a video game this um online that you can play. It's like, oh, really? And then they get into it, and then I was like, okay, I want to try the miniature game. Like, can you teach me? And hence, the in- I was telling you about the influx of new people I got to teach. And mind you, these weren't people that were like from GW. This is just curious people, you know, that were seeing my players having fun. Several years ago, we didn't really have any, but there was a couple of us in town that played, but nobody could ever pick a day to get together and actually do it. And it was like I was telling you earlier, uh, some buddies of mine were and I were playing Magic, and I said, please, let me just do this, just this one time. And if you like it, we'll do, well, every other Sunday, we'll do it, you know, and it'll alternate. And that kind of springboarded into classic Battletech. And then we had to move to a different store. And the more money and more time that I invested in the game, like building 3D boards and painting the miniatures and things like that, people would walk by and they would say, what are you doing here? And I, I made a series about this, uh, how to grow battle tech in your area. And it's a three part series here on the channel. And it was basically like anytime anybody walks by, you know, just be friendly, be welcoming, be, you know, people will come back when they feel wanted, willing and welcome. You know, they, they're they wanted there, they're willing to show up and, and you know, that kind of thing. So that's what we do here. We go to different stores too. Uh, we just played Battletech at an escape room <laughs> the other night. And we had several people walking by going, you know, what on earth is this? And we would explain it to them. And I, I ended up being known as the Battletech guy here in town. And I'm like, great, that's what I want. And you know, they, they, I would get contacted. And so before the pandemic started, we were getting up to 10 to 12 people a week showing up to the tables and that was about as much as i could handle just one person but uh now we have a tournament you know where we're doing eight players in pods of four and so that's what we did is we just kind of we were consistent we were there every week we were friendly anytime anybody walked up to the table we had a little sign on the table that said this is what we're doing and we engaged with those people and i really feel like engagement is important being friendly being welcoming and being there uh Let's see, with me here in Los Angeles, um, same story. I have a fairly friendly disposition, even though that is not shown on Battletech International when I decide to, you know. <laughs> so lay I, down the hammer, yeah. Not necessarily lay down the hammer, I become Judge Dredd. I am, you know, Judge Jury Executioner. <laughs> you know, if not Randall or if not uh, Randy over here or... Um, Mike Wheelam. Or Robert. This is Robert at the, the Trade and Sell Group because he eyeballs it too. But I, um, in a personal matter, when you see me at um, Odyssey Games Pasadena, that's where I frequent, uh, I always have a friendly demeanor there. And I always like welcome when people come and be curious about the game, I give them the breakdown and be ultra friendly about it. There's too many, I feel that there's too many groups out there sometimes that, what you would say, clicky, you know, where, ah, I don't care about new people, I just want to play by myself, but then you got new people that's interested, so you're, and you know, why, why be that way? But funny part is, um, I know myself well enough because I also don't want to drive away players, and when I play the game, I'm not going to, I'll admit by defeat, I'm ultra aggressive in the game. In okay. a game sense. I'm like, what? <laughs> I am ultra You aggressive. will play this game or else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a sign thing that I do, especially to welcome new players, you know, I give them a fighting chance against me. So I'll purposely like use a weak, a mech with like inherited weaknesses, but enough that, you know, if they don't get rid of me right away, I'm going to plink them to death. So most of the time as my trainer mech, and you're going to laugh, I would, pe- I would put people in something like a grasshopper or the thunderbolt. And I would use a Jaeger mech against them. All right, yeah. <laughs> That's a softball. <laughs> exactly. A Jaeger mech has, you know, I mean, it has firepower, but the best damage it can do is five points. So they have a stuff fighting chance, and I don't got a lot of armor. <laughs> How about you? So for, yeah, so for me, we don't we don't have um, a game store in our area. The closest one is probably, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour and a half away, or the, our closest store is where I'm at. So I actually, um, our group, I open my house up when we play. We usually try to play one to two times a, a month. Um, and we play it here at my house. And then we've been picking up new players that are getting into the game. And they're like, hey, I've actually, the last four players have um, <clears throat> come through the store or through the buy-sell trade site 
um, where they're interested in stuff. And then we start talking. And so I've got guys that are coming up from Charlotte. I've got guys that are um, coming from in the surrounding area for where we're at who have been coming over to play and then been teaming up with um, Death Ray Design. We went and did an event over at their their um, their manufacturing building over there. They set a table and we had, I think there was eight of us there, but usually when we're at my house, we only have anywhere from anywhere from six to we've had as many as um, 14 people um, over here gaming. And usually when we get that many, we just set it up so that's a mass game and everybody's just talking and having a good time. And But, but for new players, they're getting to learn the rules and they're not necessarily getting overwhelmed because they got people that are experienced next to them, helping them talk it through and and look at strategies and it makes them feel a little bit more comfortable um in that regard so we've been doing a lot of that kind of stuff randall what do you got going on uh got quite a few, few things um put together central florida battle tech uh so that was a group to just let people know hey we're alive and well here in central florida and we've got something like 38 members on the page but uh, of course we've got i got somebody from ontario canada in there and i'm like <laughs> Okay, All you know, right. hey, you know, hey. <laughs> maybe you'll come down for vacation and we'll, we'll get a game in. You know, um, uh, I put together an Alpha Strike campaign book um, that's available on the Alpha Strike International file section. Um, so one of the things for that, we always played like 300 point games and we were doing pretty consistent, you know, every other week, every uh, minimum once a month type of games so people were, were seeing us but then when we started talking about we're pulling out these battle maps with the whole world scale and we're moving little click uh, little tokens around us to, to show where our blips are and they're like what the heck are you doing oh this is a campaign what do you mean yeah this is good this is my mercenary force i'm going up against their op four and uh we've gotten uh, probably a dozen players who who've done done at least one campaign in this local area uh, and we're a small area so i mean trying to continue to do events we've got we got a pretty healthy mix of the classic battletech players and then the alpha strike players so we're trying to mix both of those so that we get some crossbreeding sure does so some of the old uh, uh classic players are like no nah, i don't want to play alpha strike and then some of the alpha strike players are like no nah, battle tech's too too cumbersome but if you do like a two hour three hour event not much investment in that so right. come out have fun you already know half the people so come on and have fun <laughs> see i know patrick does this and i've done it too uh, we have some gaming conventions here in town uh one of what uh, is called tokyo and tulsa it's kind of like an anime convention but i mean come on stompy robots fit right into that that whole mentality and we had a thing down here called maneuvers con but i know that that patrick's had one recently here in his area where uh he's taken battle tech and i've done that too uh, uh robert didn't you haven't you done something like that we've got the, um the tournament coming up yeah that's right that we're gonna be doing uh that's november 6th and 7th uh, we've already got 18 signed up now i know that you've talked about that here before on the show but let's just pretend that the person watching this right now hasn't seen that uh tell them about what's going on uh, so for us we're doing the alpha strike tournament it's going to be 350 points uh you play your whole 350 uh it's six rounds over two days uh, about two hours a game uh, there's a, a rules packet it's on the F fortress site it's tagged at the top but um we we've got plenty of facility we got tons of going to be in a school gym so we've got heat or ac as we need it and we got like i said tons of space and table and be able to spread out and we're gonna um we're gonna have a good old time it's gonna be paint there's gonna be a ton of of swag and prize support and some good stuff so and this is in november november 6th and 7th yep fantastic and north carolina yeah yeah winston say it's gonna be in winston salem north carolina and Patrick, you just had a gaming con experience, didn't you? Yeah. Um, in here in California, I'm because well, I help volunteer. I'm a volunteer staff on a convention called Strategicon, which is uh, three times each year. So our last one was in Labor Day, uh, Labor Day week, some weekend called Gateway. It's a uh, Gateway, and I believe that the game that was played there 
was Alpha Strike. But some of the veteran players of that of the con were talking to me about possibly doing a massive battle, which we, which we had before in the past. But that was in classic, and that was done within a span of three days. So now we're going to try this on with Alpha Strike, and it's going to be Battle of Tukian. And guess what? At you're full invited. scale. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you're invited, <laughs> I, I, I I helped put that worm in their ear. Like, can we do this in Alpha Strike, you guys? <laughs> we'll get it done in half the time. I so like that idea. idea. Yeah, so the idea so far is to get like an entire, like almost like an entire cluster versus a uh, uh, army but i think we scaled it down to like two trinaries two trinaries yeah against a level three which is about you know the same the same uh, point value because i think we can go like an easy like 35 units because you know if you, if you include a star bot like a nova or something like that that's a that's a star of elementals so that's an easy 35 units for the clan 36 for um the com guards so here's a question I want to put to everybody. Um, I ask this a lot of, of people that I have on the show, but it's interesting because everything is always in motion and everything is changing. And the answer that I got six to seven months ago is going to be different than the answer I get now. So I want to put this out there with this resurgence, with this supposed you know cultural shift of all the Warhammer 40K players that are supposedly coming in. Uh, the new miniatures coming out, the big interest there is in brick and mortar retail stores, that kind of thing. Where do you think Battletech is going? What does the future of this look like to you right now? Oh, guy, I, it's you're playing Uno and you just hit the reverse on me here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, I really think that, uh, you know, Alpha Strike is the future because um, every time we went into games before so when classic came out uh you'd have like four on four and people would look at it and they go ah eh, that's kind of interesting and then they'd look over at the warhammer table and they'd see all these miniatures all over the place and like ooh, and that that gravitate instantly over there but lately um they look at the alpha strike tables and they're like what are you guys playing and, and i've i've started you know, messing with the messing with their heads a little bit. So I bring out you know at at walkers with you know some ATSTs, and I, <laughs> I've got stormtroopers for my infantry, and, and I'm just proxying a couple of units. And they're like, "Are are are you playing Star Wars against? Is that BattleTech? W what's going on here?" And just that that seeing that the scale of it that you can do. You know, we've got a game uh, we're planning right now uh, for. The, the Halloween weekend, um, five thousand PV per side. Um, so we're looking at close to a hundred units on the attacker side. The defender is going to have, uh, I think he's got thirty six. Uh, this is a, a big fight. Now he's going to be doing a fighting retreat. Uh, so completely completely different uh, tactic than to just a standard 300 versus 300 or something like that. But the scale of this is going to be huge. We're taking up an entire 12 foot table to play this game. So that kind of stuff with, uh, you know, we've got 3D printed uh, terrain that we're putting out there. Um, just the quality of our, our board is catching people's eyes. We've got buildings, we're going to be using artillery. Uh, letting them know that, hey, we've got aerospace coming in. They're like, wait a minute, you've got aerospace, mechs, infantry, artillery, uh, yeah, minefields out here, you know, and every dead dead mech that's out there is is an obstacle on the field now. Like, whoa, what, what is going on here? And we never had that level of, of detail. So when we start looking at other game systems that are out there, um, They've got a lot of detail on the you know infantry shooting against other infantry, and they've got all these crazy little little rules and stuff. But we've got scale that is so much bigger, broader, and, and gives us a lot of flexibility and tactical turn in turns as well. So I, that's where I think it, it needs to go because that number one, it catches people's eyes, and Alpha Strike is fast enough that you can learn you can learn the game in five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Very quick. I I totally concur on my end. Um, I like I said, I would always teach people Alpha Strike first because it's a more simpler um, way of uh, learning the game. 
Um, Randy is correct that if you if I if, if I start with classic with the regular maps, you know, regular hex maps, you know, it seems a little like bland to them. They see the miniature, but the terrain isn't there. Um, because Alpha Strike, you know, you actually put down terrain, it catches their eye. So not just the mechs, now that you got the terrain to go with it, bam! Now, because now they're invested into it. And that's what makes things, I think, cool. So now, like, I even use, I'm not gonna lie, I end up using some of those 40k terrains, you know, for my Alpha Strike games. Why but not? guess what? Guess it what? Works. It got their it got their attention, and the people are going, "Is that 40k?" When they realize it's not 40k, and it's actually Battle Tech. Oh, that's Battle Tech. I'm like, I'm there. I, and they would like some of the older player older players would go, "Hey, I've never seen it played that way before." And I tell them, "This is a new, a simple way of playing the game, and you can field armies with it instead of just lances." Yeah. Well, I'm gonna take a different approach to your question. With where do I think the game? And where everything is going, I think that right now, if if CGL can keep the focus, and I think that's an important aspect of all this, is keeping it focused. Um, I, with what they're doing with with previously from the Kickstarter, the Force packs, I think are huge. I think um, putting everything to scale now that's coming out, everything is going to be scaled properly. I think all those aspects, um, and if they can continue that, the quality of the miniatures that are coming out, um, and I know you know they're they're going to roll the new ones over to Ironwind Metal, so they'll be available for those guys that like metal. Um, but the quality of the, of the resin that and the stuff that's available out there, you know, they're they're putting out what is it like a, a, a freaking a new novel a month or faster than that? I, I think so for for that end of it, keeping people interested in the game and the lore, you know, they've um the you know we just had the ill clan and the tamar pack supposed to be a, available for christmas or right before christmas uh, you know all those kind of things are just driving the game forward um which helps keep all of us old folks still interested in the game and where is it going and where is it leading to and then it helps us because we're pumped for it i mean there, you got you got to remember there was there were some lulls and there were some low points for, for the game and right now everybody's excited and and if we can keep that excitement up um i you know it helps us draw in new players and we're excited when we're sitting there playing it but when things are down you know are we at the, the game stores and playing as much are we doing these kind of things um you know not necessarily and we're not i, I got back into into it and in, enforced because i loved it from way back when it was my favorite game ever and i had kept up with the lore some but to get back into it you know seven years ago or whatever but that we're not going to draw new new people into it that way and we need right. that that excitement and where they're taking it and so i hope that they continue that trend that we don't lose focus with other projects you know i know that there's they got some other kickstarters that they want to do um like Leviathans is supposed to be coming up and, and, you know, and then they may be doing some other stuff. I know that they're already talking about doing the next battle tech one. And I think that's, that's good. Um, but we got to keep striking while the iron's hot and get this, get things even bigger so that it, it holds its own and holds its own pace. I think the shrapnel books are good. It's exciting to have, you know, other people than the regular authors able to contribute and, and, and write in. Um, and getting their stuff published, which keeps them excited and writing stories and, and different activities and stuff. So, I mean, I think it's in a good place. We just, we got to help, help them keep it focused. So you brought up a new Kickstarter and this is not something I've heard of. So I, I would love it if you would tell me about it just because I want to hear. Spoilers! <laughs> if you can't well, talk about it, that's that's totally cool. But you said, and my ears went boing, and I'm like, wait, what? Well, I, there, there's always been talk about they're going to do a new one and when are they going to do the new one? Uh, there's no date for it yet. Um, I think in a perfect world, it probably would have already, <laughs> it would already be happening or just about to happen now, but you know, COVID threw everything off. Sure. I do know Leviathans is supposed to be next. Um, they keep saying that. So we'll, we'll see if that happens or not. Um, but you know, hopefully I, I think there's some talk about maybe vehicles. I don't, you know, maybe it, there's going to be some more mechs and stuff like that, but. I would definitely um, yeah. like to see some vehicles. I, I think they're due for some vehicles. I think, you know, I think VTOLs and tanks and 
they they really need to re-explore the idea of infantry. I know it's really tough when you're talking them teeny tiny little six millimeter guys, but I think that you know when when we think about BattleTech, especially Alpha Strike, as you guys are talking about Alpha Strike, the combined arms is where it's at, um, and even in Alpha Strike too. I mean, it's easy to roll the mechs, but you know a tank has a whole lot more value in Alpha Strike than it does in Classic um, Infantry. Uh, the abilities that they bring to the tabletop um it, it kind of expands it in some ways i mean there's nothing quite like you know having your mech stop drop and roll on a unit of infantry in classic style but <laughs> um but in alpha strike yeah you know, the potential that units have for combined arms is really really good and, and i would hope that they're gonna look at that i, I you know i hope that they look at and there's talk about you know maybe something new with aerospace um and coming up with some sort of fighter style game you know um you know they recently there's the Battlestar Galactica the new the new game for that and you've got the X-Wing style and you've got um all kinds of other stuff I mean as crazy as it is you know do y'all remember way back before aerospace the original FASA the the top gun box set had the rules <laughs> that you could play oh battle fighters I, I, um, I think I have that box somewhere. Rule set. Yeah, I, I, I still got them. And so, I, you know, I, I think that aerial combat kind of stuff, I, that would just be one more niche that, or I mean, one more peg that would just nail it for them on the board of bringing gamers in. I, I mean, now, now you're drawing in all the other kinds of guys. I do want to add in, uh, so Alpha Strike stats for the dropships and jump ships were released on the forums. So we finally have something that we can actually say, hey, here's the official stats. And it's free. Yeah, yeah free. Uh, that, that's the other thing. Entry point, masterunitlist.info is yep. free. And it has every single unit that's currently in, publish, uh, in publication on there. Some of them aren't, aren't fully statted out, but 5,000 and some odd units are. You have plenty to look through there. Well, and, and that leads to the community, even with what Battletech International, but when you look at the community with the master unit list, you look at Sarna, you look at um, all the different information that is available by other gamers and by the fans, you don't see that necessarily everywhere else. I mean, there's there's some links and some community and camaraderie that just don't exist everywhere else. And I think that's a huge part of Battletech and what helps make Battletech a great game. Um, you know, and, and some people, they just love the lore and they're not into the game and playing the miniatures. And there's other people that are only into the miniatures and it doesn't matter which one you're into. You can be in all aspects of it. So, um, I was just okay. telling somebody earlier, it's your sandbox. You know, this is, it's Battletech, but it's also your game. And if this is what you want to do, if you think it would work, I said, running like a Battletech campaign is like writing bad Battletech fan fiction. There is nothing off the table. There is nothing that is too cringe. If you want to do this and you think it'll be fun and your players are into it, I don't care. Do what you want. <laughs> but look at the bright side. When our players did their own fan fiction, or even their own film, like on YouTube, like, I think somebody did that one long time ago with, uh, you know, um, Republic of the Spear and uh, and Anastasia Kerensky. I forgot that one. That was like an interesting one. I thought it was cool. At least um, Catalyst Games didn't go after them. Unlike them. Right? <laughs> we are able to create our own magic. And, you know, I think that's where, where at least... Um, the people from Catalyst Games at least allow us to expand our own thing. So the, it helps the game. So they see it and that's why they don't get, they don't go now. We got to cut that thing out. Right. Yeah. Look at what they did with the, the MechWarrior cards. So as part of the Kickstarter, you could get your face put into the fiction. So it's like, hey, that just shows that they are actually taking fans and bringing them into the universe in a way that I've never seen any other uh, company do that. So uh, my hat is off to them for trying to encourage people and just give everybody that immersion that they're looking for. Well, and even the, the new wave of art 
that is coming out for Battletech. You know, that there's a resurgence there that's just, it's beautiful. And there's some amazing stuff coming out. Um, and, and, you know, and the guys are being supported again for doing it. And, you know, and, and people are being encouraged. And how many people didn't necessarily have anything to do with Battletech a few years ago? And here they are now as, you know, creators and artists and designers. You know, they, they were on the fringes and, and didn't, um, and now they're being brought into the fold, you know, and working for the company, uh, you know. What so a dream I, that's got to be. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, here you are, you, you did it for fun for how long and on your own. And now here you are, you get to still do it for fun and you're being supported for it. So. Um, I mean, what Tex my, is uh, doing the voiceover for uh, some audio, audible books. Yeah, oh, stack yeah. Pulse, stuff. stack pulse stuff. That's, yeah, stack yeah. pulse books. Uh, and, I mean, who knows? You know, who knows where it's going to lead to and and from and and the opportunities that come along with it. Um, it's it's definitely. I'm excited. I used to tell people when they would say, "Oh, that's a dead game." I'd say, "This will be dead when I'm dead." Because that's when you'll have to pry it from my cold, dead fingers. But until then, I'm going to take anybody that I can possibly get that's into any other kind of miniature war game and say, look, just just give me a chance. Just give me one game to sell you on this. And if you like it, cool. If you don't, no worries. I won't, I won't get mad at you. And it's worked out so far for me. I do have my I do have my own special treat for fans. All I ask our, our, our friend, fans over here at the group page to, hit, is to heed is please. I just, we just simply want you to read... Uh, rules. We want everybody to have fun. Um, we have a set of rules to make sure that you know the inmates don't run the asylum. We let you know that we actually run the asylum. We we're not unreasonable people. If there is a problem, please approach any of the admins, moderators. We're more than reasonable to hear you out. All you gotta be, all you gotta do is be, you know don't, you know come come to us about it. Uh, you know one of our first questions. Are you going to read all the rules and uh, <laughs> rules of, of the group? It's right there. You can't. That's why I keep telling people I don't accept. I don't, I don't accept. I didn't know as an excuse. You know, I, I mean, I'm not unreasonable because people say like, oh, my God, you don't 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 start things. Patrick will be all over you. You're not ex you're not wrong about that. <laughs> but, you know, I'm also a reasonable person. If you tell me if you come to me and say like oh i'm sorry i did this i might i might not even punish you at all it amazes me how many people don't answer three basic questions and have you read the rules and you, will you comply yes that's it's not, simple it's not, <laughs> rock, it's not rocket science even in the trade and sell group you know that that those are like a no-brainer and we like i said we welcome everybody We're, there's no like, oh my God, this is no, like, oh my God, this guy's a GW guy. He can't be in here. <laughs> nope, we're not like that <laughs> at all. As long and, as they don't work for Harmony Gold. Right. All right, we well, gotta cut that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, copyright infringement. Here, you know, Patrick, the Taskmaster, saw rare, or rarely rats. You'll notice that. But guess what? This episode of Battlebound, I get to. <laughs> so here's Patrick's rant, and I'll just make it quick and simple, and it's just a matter of opinion. You do not have to take me seriously. Don't first worry, I never do. <laughs> first, and, <laughs> first and foremost, I am very happy that Battletech is gaining its own identity. I mean, take a look at this Marauder. It's its own identity. But it's not like the original Marauder. Okay, it's not like the original Marauder. So what? But guess what? That's a borrowed anime mech. I mean, I'm not against like the old stuff that we kept in the past. After all, that was the history of the game, you know? But I don't like this notion that without the tw uh, those 12 mechs from that box set, you know, the game's over. It's not. I got to say, though, that, that seeing the Marauder for the first time and, and you know, I was... I don't know, 12 years old or something like that. But my friend pulls out the Marauder and he pulls out the, the uh, Stinger and I'm like, Robotech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, that's how I got into the game to begin, yeah. which is the funniest Same. thing. <laughs> because I, I thought the box said, said Robotech. Nope, it was Battletech. I mean, back then, this is the 80s, okay? When Battletech was still in its infancy, there was still not a lot of things, not a lot of things that people knew about. But a lot of the original, so-called original stuff that Battletech came up back in the day were not so original. I mean, 
There's a mercenary unit called the Fighting Urukai. Hmm. Gee, I wonder <laughs> right. where they got that. Um, let's see. Um, Team Bonsai? I don't know. Buckaroo Bonsai? Huh? Huh? <laughs> they even have the logo. <laughs> and, and, right. Yeah, exactly. And here, and I'm going to go with my unit, Wolf's Dragoons. The unit that I love, Zeta Battalion. Apparently, for some weird reason, Char Asnabal from, Gund- from Gundam decided to become a member of Wolf's Dragoons. <laughs> It's actually in the Wolf's Dragoon source book, and I was like, huh? We've so, changed the names to protect the innocent. Exactly. Well, they killed That's them the off. They killed them off in misery, which is funny, but, you know, I was like going, okay, now I know I did, did that. But a lot of the, like, in regards of the unseen mechs, people didn't want to let go to the past. That's why these new scenes are the ones that are brought back. And I thought, I, I think all these new sculpts that came out was actually very good and close enough. So it gave battle, like, its actual identity without having to borrow what was in the past. I mean, as much as I love um, Mac- Macross or Dugram, you know, that was not really the identity of the game, in my opinion. And then the other, my other part of my rant is anybody can play any era of the game. I don't like this notion with these um, ignorant people that, oh, the game died because of the clan invasion. You got, I'm sorry to say you guys are a bunch of uh, ignorant people because if the game stayed in 3025 all day long, it would not have gone nowhere and then the game would have really died. Yep. You have to have growth. Exactly. And that's one of the things about the, the universe. Is, uh, I've watched other games that they have three factions, five factions, whatever it is, and they bring out the, te- the initial technology and nothing ever changes. Uh, Battletech started 3025. And then they went, oh, Star League. Here's a, here's a bunch of stuff that was in the past that was better. And then now, now it shows you where, where why they're in a Dark Age type of uh, scenario. And then they have the clans come in. And they've got even better technology than what they had in the past. You're like, okay, well, now how's this going to balance? Now, that's one of the my rants is... Uh, <laughs> balancing, back at, yeah. Right, balancing back in classic Battletech time. We're, we're talking 1992 time frame. So... It, nobody had an idea, so they came up with battle value. And battle value was so flawed and so I'm gonna, horrible. I'm going to interrupt managed. you on that one and actually correct you. Before even battle value, there's one called combat value. Combat initial, value. I was yeah. just saying that to somebody, uh, DRD, yeah. the other day. It was uh, an initial attempt to balance the game because back then, most people, when they ran like campaign games or like even casual scenarios, let's go, hey, let's go at 200 tons. Right. But that didn't really balance the game because they didn't factor in the, like the pilot or anything of that sort. So their first attempt to remedy that was combat value, but it didn't work out either because that's another thing. They barely acknowledged the uh, pilot. So when Battle Value 1 came out, it somewhat balanced the skills just a little, and then now Battle Value 2 just a little bit more. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that's where they came up with the clan honor and the, the bidding down kind of concept. I think that works very well in lore because you have this fiction and you don't have to worry about what the actual dice rolls are. Right. (laughs) But when you translate that onto the battlefield, uh, clan lore doesn't work. I I think when you look at, you know, the game's been around 37 odd years or something like that now. Uh, The game has evolved well. Um, you know, especially over the past few years where they've tweaked the miniatures. But, and even when you, you know, you take your 3028 players and you take your 3150 players, you can still throw them all together. You can, you can play however you want. You can mix your tech. You can, you can play through it and the game, you, you can see the lore. You can see the game has evolved. I mean, if you go back and you take second edition box set and you look at the game of armor car core box set you can have played 30 years ago and step in and play now and the game hasn't changed that much um it's tweaked enough uh, to fit here and there but without like completely rewriting the game and it's not like and they haven't done like many other companies have done where they go in and they wipe the slate clean and we start over again or we oh no we had some you know um major event and you know the whole thing has changed and we're going to rewrite the history and we're going to rewrite all this other kind of stuff now granted dark age they're kind of avoiding that 
um, in the new stuff. <laughs> yeah, where you can still play it if you want. Go for it. Jump in. Play it. It's not a problem. You know, there's there's still plenty of people that are interested in the different aspects of all that, and you and you can obviously get away with it and play it. But they're just not going to talk about it much anymore and kind of move move on from there. But it still exists, or they find a way to include it. I mean, geez, how do you you take the freaking crappy ass cartoon and and make it into, um, you know, it was propaganda. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, how you read propaganda. It. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, so I, I I think, and that goes back to the fans and to the people and the people who write and and for it are fans of the game, and so how do they help make it fit? Uh, we can all have like our little niche. We can all love it. We can all play it. Um, you know, look at Alpha Strike. You can run that thirty twenty eight mech just as easy as you can run that thirty one fifty mech. And you know, yeah, it's not gonna. You're gonna be able to play it however you want to play it. So, and that's what I love about the longevity of the game because, like you said, the the mechs that you got in your original box set back in nineteen ninety two are just as valid today as they were back then uh, yep. drop it on the table pull out a card pull out a, a, a sheet go to war yeah it, as compared to other games where they have literally gone hey this army that you spent hundreds of dollars on and thousands of hours painting up uh, yeah. it's not worth no it anymore uh, they suck yeah oh by the nerfed it by the new one that's <laughs> exactly like it only these have stats that are better. <laughs> no, I just need you to go in and change your bases. All your bases have to be changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bases have to change. And your measurement stick has to change. Yeah. It has to have symbols now instead of, you know, actual ruler. You know, why would we use standard measure? Yeah, and I, um, that, that's the whole, I mean, and, and it gets into, uh, we talk about how long the game has been around. There is so much stuff that is Battletech related that um, I mean, I literally hear about something new probably every week. It is amazing um, where it's kind of gotten to and, and led. You know, there, there's just a lot of stuff. When you think about, you know, there's Joyride and there was Reaper and there's <coughs> Kinect and there's Tyco and there's, I mean, it just, the list is on and on and on and on um, with everything out there, Fan Pro and CGL and Fasa and the magazines and um, I don't even have any of the Comnet magazines. Those are all over in the UK. You know, for all our fans out there, you know, just know that there's a lot to come to the game. The fact that it still lives and continues should tell you otherwise. This is not one game that you can say like, oh, it's dying. It's just, it, no, I assure you, it's not, not dying. So what do you guys think about the possibility, you know, even if it's a fan you know, dream possibility of either a TV series or, or a movie or something that actually has a budget. I, I, I would kill for that. I mean, I, don't I, get me. Go I ahead, Robert. That would be, I, I was just gonna say, I think that would be the ultimate testament to the game and the lore. I mean, you, you, you know, you think about some of the other stuff that they've done shows for, I think the potential I mean, you could write it as like a Game of Thrones kind of stuff and draw people in who don't give a crap about mechs and, and all that aspect of it just because of that that part of the lore and, and, and the writing that's gone along with the game for so long. But I think then you could build into the battle part of it for those of us that are mech nerds and, and want to see that aspect of it. I think there's there's a ton of potential, but I think it comes down to the dollar bill and you know we're we're not large enough quite yet to to draw that in but maybe i feel like if it got done it would have to be a serialized type television you know like a netflix gimmick or hulu exclusive or something like that i don't i don't think you could have a movie until you'd done enough TV shows like uh, Stargate SG-1 had done. Then you can do a movie later once you've established what all this stuff is. Because I think the biggest argument at that point would be, well, where do we start? Like, what era do we start this in? And how do we build up and not have it take a million years to get to this era or that era? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I'll be so honest, I almost... Firefly to Firefly movie, and hopefully it would go more than one season, you know? Right? 
I totally agree. I, say, I, I would rather see it go as a season than ever go as a movie because I feel yeah. like um, movies limit it sometimes. You know, you sure, you can only get so many hours. In. Right. Whereas if you know, you could go, you could easily do. Okay, here's a season of thirty twenty five. Here's a season of thirty thirty. Here's a season of thirty fifty. Here's you know, you could build off of that aspect of it, and you can get a lot of seasons out of BattleTech now. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, look at it this. Way. I'm gonna use uh, I'm gonna use um Star Wars as an example. I mean, take a look how they branched out where they branched out to not just the actual you know regular movies that you see but they branched out to something like um clone wars rebels bad batch mandalorian you could go with real you could go with like real life because uh, real actors or you can go in voice actors and it'll still be a great product because you know it's you know something that has a good story it's right. just a matter how interpretation of it um don't get me wrong the original <laughs> the original animated one was uh, more like a rush job. I wouldn't say it's like terrible, like terrible, terrible. It was just a rush job. They tried to condense everything into like a twelve episode. Was it a twelve episode? Is it? I think so. Off the top of my head, I can't remember. Yeah, it was a twelve episode thing, and you know, it, it didn't have a real explanation. And we know that the um, the lore of the game is much more than that. Right. Yeah, if they could get get the depth that like Clone Wars did, because I mean, granted, you had Star Wars that did the movies and it was huge, successful, so that they knew that it was kind of golden cash cow. They just had to, to the money was already there. Yeah, you put ink on paper and stick it on TV, splash that that Star Wars logo on it. It made money. Yeah, um, but if they could get anything close to that level of quality out of a, a comic cartoon i think it would be a success and it would, that would be like next generation of uh players for the next 30 years <laughs> i just want you know the purpose of this was just to let people our fans there know that the community has gotten very very large and social media has pretty much done that you know and with some the fact that are like Battle Ticket International, I wouldn't say, I would also say is like definitely a, a known, a re very known place for the culture. You know, and he, he, some, some of the, like some of the immediate, uh, some of the people that help run it should be represented and tell people like how exactly it is and what can we do to improve. And uh, the only thing I want to say is just to all the other moderators, because, you know, I haven't been doing this that long versus you all, all you other guys. But, you know, it's a huge thank you just for keeping up with it all and moderating it all and, you know, and promoting it all and, and starting all the other pages and all that kind of stuff. I kind of fell into this. I, you know, wasn't like I ever intended to be <clears throat> part of all that in that regard. Um, I was just buying and selling. Sure. <laughs> and trade and uh you know and the rest of it kind of all happened but you know it, there's a lot of people that put the legwork in way before i ever did anything and so you know it's yeah. it's the many hours and for everybody you know everybody that does participates in the hobby and all that kind of stuff so kudos to everybody else for that part of it so um and I'd like to make a shout out to the remaining um, founders of Battletech International, which is Nadja, Thomas, um, Mike Wheelam, Alex Clark, and even um, even uh, Derek, Derek King. You know, he was um, all personnel, and including Randy and Robert here, has been very instrumental to the success of Battletech International. Well, all right, everybody, it's been an absolutely fantastic session. I'm so glad that you were all able to sit down here with me at this little round table at the same time. So I sure hope you've had a good time. Sailor. That's been great. <laughs> yep, it's awesome. Much appreciated. Appreciate it. We will see you all later and catch you on the Space Lanes. Your ideas are intriguing to me, and I wish to subscribe to your newsletter. Crowdfunding is when lots of people give you small amounts of money to help your passion project come to life. 